I'll just jump straight into the questions then. So uh, throughout Glorious, there's really just one actor with uh, Wes, and that's Ryan playing him. Uh, what's it like just directing one actor basically throughout the entire runtime? It was an absolute blast. And I will say we had a ton of rehearsals going in. So we, um, JK and Ryan had been running the script over Zoom for weeks before we ever got to set. So they knew exactly what the other person was doing. Like they knew the exact temper, the pacing, the tone that the lines were gonna be delivered with. And we did have somebody on set reading JK's lines, which was one of our producers, Morgan Peter Brown, um, who was literally sitting in Gat's stall, um, reading every single one of the lines. Because when you're filming in a box, we discovered that it was really like, no matter where we put him, no matter what corner we had him stashed in, we would pick him up. And so we were like, well, the only place on set you can sit is in the dark stall. And so he was literally sitting there with clip light reading the, the lines for the majority of the movie while we were recording. <laughs> so, um, but with Ryan by himself, like we knew the restrictions of that going in. We knew um, kind of what our Achilles heel would be was that it's one location and basically one actor for the entire movie. And so then it became, how can we mitigate that? How do we make it interesting to look at so that it's not just constantly on Ryan's face? Um, and so then it was all kinds of things that we had to bring in on a production level, like treating the stall like its own character. Um, like I do push-ins on the stall. I do dirty overs from the stall to Ryan and back. Like we're constantly treating the stall and specifically the glory hole artwork like it's a character. Like I use its eyes um, for reaction shots, um, which is crazy because they don't move, but it's reaction shots in the movie. Um, and then letting the emotion of how we're treating the stall as the second character dictate what type of movement the camera is doing. Is it a fast push and is it slow? Does it swoop in? Um, and then after that, it was the idea that if we're shooting in a box, it's going to get real boring if I'm just doing locked shots. If it's just, you know, close up, medium, close up, okay, wide, um, it's going to get real dry. So it was the idea that we knew that the camera had to constantly be moving. I even had my original pitch deck that this was going to be the most cinematically um, uh, um, appetizing uh, bathroom movie ever made. And, um, and that's what we really aimed for. So we knew that like the lighting had to be lush. And because I knew I constant, I wanted constant movement with the camera, we would rehearse the scenes in giant chunks. We would run like eight page scenes in rehearsal, get the blocking down, and then we would choreograph it with the camera. So we would run these massive eight page scenes and we called them dances on set where it was um, Ryan dancing with the camera for a solid eight pages. And it might take us 20 minutes to get through a take, but we would do three of those. And then we do like go back and see what other angles we need to do the dance from. Um, but that way we could keep the camera moving and we had this constant camera and Ryan working in tandem like dance partners throughout the entire thing. Um, and it was it was a wild way to film, but we we loved the way that it turned out because it is so such heavy movement throughout the entire thing. Oh yeah, no, it definitely feels like the character take or the camera takes on its own character in a way, along with Ryan, really bringing yeah. the audience with it. Um, and speaking of the bathroom, uh, I kind of felt like the bathroom was its own character throughout the entire movie. And I'm it curious, is. is this something y'all built on, like a built on a set? Or is this a real bathroom that y'all utilized? Just like oh, in God. the public. <laughs> People kept asking if I wanted to use a real bathroom. And I was like, that's disgusting. Um, these Ryan has to literally crawl around on it for the entire movie. Um, and the big thing from a filmmaker perspective, it sucks to shoot a bathroom. Like bathrooms, they're small, they're reflective. Everything in a bathroom is meant to be reflective, whether it's the faucets or the mirrors or even just the tile work, everything's reflective. Additionally, they're all real echoey, like most bathrooms have a strong echo to them, and they're not shooting friendly. It's always really, really tiny and compact. They're not made for, you know, to feel wide and comfortable. And so um, we knew from the get-go that we were, we explored, you know, options of shooting in a real bathroom. And then we quickly were like, it's just, it's not going to work because we did need this bathroom to give a performance. And I'm glad you called it a third character because we kept calling it the third character um, when we were making the film. It was like, we got Ryan, we got Gat, and then we have the bathroom. And the bathroom had to give a performance in its own way where we decided to um, give it its own character. Like I said, 
Um, I wanted the bathroom to be, this was the nicest looking rest stop in the town back in 1976. And then everybody forgot about it. So we have like racing stripes on the wall. It's very 1970s. Um, we gave it kind of a roller disco theme and then it just kind of fell apart from there. Um, additionally, the bathroom needed to perform for us. Like we had to have a vent that could be opened that Ryan could feasibly crawl through and keep going. We had to have um, the faucets that work. The mirrors had to be broken in a very specific manner um, so that Ryan could see himself and look in the mirror and see the stall behind him. But we could still plant a camera underneath at about shoulder height and not pick ourselves up. Um, the walls could not be reflective. So there's no tile on the walls, they're brick. And so every single thing in that bathroom um, is, is very much like designed to be friendly for shooting. Additionally, every wall flies out. Anytime we're shooting in the stall, there is no stall wall there. We would pop it down if we were gonna shoot in the stall. We got to the point where we could take it down in 30 seconds. Um, and we actually did rip the urinal out. So we had to kind of build it so that the urinal would come out as well. That's crazy that it was that you could break it apart that easily. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Every wall fell out. We could take um, the back stall behind him off if we wanted to. Like it was, it was built to, to be taken apart. Especially in those cramp shots. You don't really notice you feel cramped in with the character. Yeah. And that was always, you know, if we have to put lights and camera and all that fun stuff, a sound person behind it, we needed space to get it in. And it's still going to feel cramped because he's in a corner. Mm -hmm. And what would you say like the most difficult thing on set to shoot was? Um, you know, any, but they're also my favorite days. Anytime that we're doing practical effects, it always grinds your production to a halt. Like you get, you know, we were running eight page scenes and we were running these massively long takes and we were doing these really kind of theatrical style of getting it where it's these massive long takes kind of running it as a very theatrical production. And then I'd say, you know, okay guys, it's time to make the embryonic sack. And then everything grinds to a halt while you try to figure that out. Um, we were 85 to 90% practical. Anything that we could um, execute on set, we did. And then it was just like cleaning up themes or adding um, more slime in post. I was not able to make the cosmos on, um, stage so we had to that the cosmos was uh definitely a post thing um but those um the the practical effects will always be harder to shoot but they're also my favorite days because it's a lot of troubleshooting it's a lot of figuring out what can we make work um so if we're on a strapped budget and i really want an embryonic sack to be dropping below the stall what can we do that was actually a, a clear piece of plastic sheeting painted speckled we filled it with milk and then we threw a couple of glow sticks in there. And then it's four of us in the bathroom stall. Well, not me. It was four people in the bathroom stall and me at monitor going lower, lift it up, jiggle on right. And they would shake it. And so we'd get this kind of undulation with the liquid. Um, and so, yeah, those days they slow you down. They're always a little bit more difficult because you never know how it's going to turn out until you're actually staring at it. Um, but they're also, they always end up being my favorite days as well. And what would you say your favorite practical effect was then of all the ones y'all did since y'all were primarily practical? The Blood Rain by far. This one, um, that one came from my time working with Guar. Um, so my husband and I, we worked with Guar back in like the mid 2000s, like 2006, 2007. We made a Guar video and then we did um, some other work like behind the scenes stuff and shooting um, press kit stuff with them. And we were always so impressed by their ingenuity and how they were able to do these massive stage performances with blood and guts and crazy things. And everything was so performative, but it was all at the same time. So homespun, like everything was fabricated from stuff you could buy at Lowe's. And we, um, when we were working with them, everything was about paint sprayers. It was all paint sprayers and bug sprayers and the stuff that you like fertilize your lawn with. They would just go to Lowe's, they would buy a pump sprayer. And that was what would coat the audience and things like that. So um, we knew that going in that that's how we wanted to execute the blood rain, because if you want it to rain on set immediately, your producer is going to be like digital. And I was like, oh, no, we're doing this. Um, and so what you see in the movie is actually four paint sprayers at each corner of the, the actual stall. We knew we would only once the rain starts, stop, starts, stop. We would get the start once. I'll say that. Like once, as soon as it starts starting, 
um, we would never get that again. So we only got the shot shot of it starting once, but then once it started raining, we could just keep it going. And so um, we had a way that we were collecting the blood at the base and we would, it would rain. It, we had 27 gallons of blood on that day. It would rain. We would squeegee it all up and back into the sprayers. And then we would drop another 27 gallons of blood on him again. And so we were able to get it a couple of different times in different frames and yeah, do close ups. So yeah, it was, I loved that day. It was also kind of the most um, wet day on set. <laughs> Blood is like glitter on set. Like as soon as you spray it in any capacity, it's just everywhere and you're finding it in your ears. And um, even though I was not under the blood rain exactly, I, I still like you go at home at night and you're like, it's in my hair. And yeah, it just, it gets everywhere. But that was, um, that was a really fun one to execute. I also, the vortex at the end after the urinal gets sucked out and we see um, the big God at the end, technically Cthulhu, um, but we see his dad at the end. We there's a vortex that opens up. It's four leaf blowers um, positioned at corners around the room, um, which we had bought at Home Depot that morning. And it was just, and I think we returned them afterwards. Um, you know, we lit them up for like four minutes while we were filming it. And then it's really good acting on Ryan Quant's part as he's like pulling himself away from the vortex. We gave him a central point and said, the wind is swirling, it is pulling you towards this point. So as you're crawling, everything should be positioned towards this point as if it's getting pulled towards it. And he executed it beautifully. And it looks so good. I didn't even, <laughs> I wouldn't have even been able to know that was leaf blowers. <laughs> it was just leaf blowers, not even like top of the line leaf blowers. They're very much like mid-range model. <laughs> <laughs> and so with Gat, was, since y'all were practical, was that a full-sized puppet when you do eventually see the reveal of Gat at the end? The Gat the puppet, he is about four, uh, maybe two feet tall. Um, actually here, I, I will give you a tour and let you see the Gat. Hold on, can you still hear me? Yes. <laughs> so Gat is a puppet made by Russell FX. He is right, how do I position? There he is, bad really? light. That's the Gat monster here. Come here, Gat. Ah, this is Gat. That's so cool. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, Gat was made by Russell FX, and he is a full, like, armatured puppet. He can move his feet, his mouth. Um, and so, yeah, we had him on set, and we did green screen, and then we blew it up in post, and he uh, became our giant monster. Um, and that one was definitely a fun day to film because it's like you're dealing with this little foam monster, and he's actually he's quite cute, I have to say. Like, I always find him to be really kind of adorable. Less intimidating at that, that size. Yeah. Like, he's adorable. And so um, I found him to be adorable on set. So it was always like, how do we make him look kind of, you know, more vicious? We had other tentacles that we were bringing in with him. Like, this is just the core part of him. Um, and everything is kind of controlled on these sticks behind him. And we could open and close his mouth. So then it was like, how do I make it look like he's moving angrily and not like tap dancing? Yeah. Uh, so that was a really fun day on set. But yeah, Gad, um, we, we had so much fun creating him and working with him and then covering him with slime. And then afterwards, um, I decided I wanted to bring him back home with me because I wanted to keep it. And so I didn't know what else to do. So I wrapped him in plastic and put him in my carry-on luggage coming back to LA. And uh, they stopped me and the woman opens up my suitcase because they're stopping me at the security TSA. And she was like, what is this? And all I could be like, Lovecrafty and God, he was just in a movie. And it's still sopping wet with slime because <laughs> we had just shot the scene the day before. So I had it wrapped in saran wrap. It looked like a torso shoved into my luggage. Um, but yeah, it was a trip. I got him through though. And now he lives at my house. <laughs> and now he sits up with the, the shelf. <laughs> yeah. He, and my kids, like they, they call him Gat. Like they know they will never see the movie until they're like 18. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they know him as Gat and they know him as Cthulhu's, you know, he's related to Cthulhu because they do know who Cthulhu is. And, um, they put bunny ears on him at Easter time. He got a Christmas hat and yeah. So That's so he's, cute. <laughs> you know. And I guess just lastly, uh, giving advice to students who want to do what you do, um, what would you tell them? Never wait for Hollywood. I see that in so many of my USC students where they come to school, they finish their time at USC. I am a fully trained filmmaker now. And then they sit there and they wait. 
um, for Hollywood to apparently come knock at their door and be like, I got $10 million. Can I read your script? And it does not go down like that. Um, you have to be willing to make that first feature yourself. Like that is a big step. And so I always encourage my students to not just think about writing the giant script that, you know, they think is going to be the next Marvel movie, write the one you could feasibly shoot in your own world. Like where, you know, if you have access to your apartment, to your parents' house, to that summer camp, your uncle owns, to your grandpa's cafe, whatever it is, where, what can you set there? And so it's very much like have a reverse engineered horror script that is based on your restrictions instead of your, you know, full expanse of free thinking. Instead, say, if I have my bedroom, I have $10,000 and I can afford three actors. What horror can happen from there? Those are my students who get that first feature done. And that first feature is what gets you more features. Without that first feature, it's hard. And that's what I see a lot of my students doing is they sit around and they wait instead of saying, I could work a summer job. I could drive Uber in the evening. I can come up with 15 grand. What can I do with 15 grand? And those are the students that I see actually working in the industry. That's awesome advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>